Yo, people, it's your boy NK, aka the man of the hour. Too sweet to be sour. We are back for another episode of Commissioner's Corner, but of course, I am not alone. I am joined with my co host, the number one black pro wrestling historian in the UK, the pro wrestling encyclopedia. We've got my boy Knowledge. How you doing, sir? I'm good. You seen this shit with Puffy? <laughs> You seen this shit? <laughs> that is not how the response I anticipated. Well, how yeah, I've seen it. You got raided by that. I've, I've been off the grid for the last little while, isn't it? Like, I've just yeah, come back man. in. You know? I'm just hearing about this now. Excuse me. <laughs> Lord have mercy. All right. Oh my god. Oh, oh. big up everyone in the chat. You know, make sh- you know, let me address the chat. First of we all. should we should just talk about puffy. I'm sorry. Oh bro. <laughs> be, I mean, Lord have mercy, child. Oh, I mean, God. to be fair, it'd be in line. There are certain there are certain man that been wrestling that need this type of treatment, anyways. But <laughs> boy, um, I know last week we promised you a new Japan in-depth podcast. We we'll, you will get that, you will get that soon. But one, we wanted to, you know, make allocate the proper amount of time for that episode. And, you know, just life happens. So, but I'm telling you, the New Japan episode will be coming soon, along with the WCW episode at some point in time. But the New Japan episode will come first. We promise you that. But big up everyone in the comment section. We got Atlas, SF Productions, and Glody in the building. Appreciate you guys. Make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you tune in to not only this, but the other content we've got in on restings. We've got the E, Indie Takers, the flagship podcast, and the various pieces of other content we got right now. We've got more episodes of Break It Down coming soon as well. So, yeah, definitely stay in tune for that. But, yeah, man, let's get straight into business. Let's talk about the headline um, of this episode, and that is the Motor, Mas- Motor City Machine Guns reportedly um, leaving TNA or their contracts, excuse me, coming up at the end of the month. So a report from Fightful Select uh, reported that the Motor City Machine Guns contracts are indeed believed to be up at the end of the month. Um, Saban and Alex Shelley's deal comes at a time where TNA is reportedly changed how they structure their contracts. Offers from TNA of late have been contractually different. Apparently, they are offering certain talent per appearance deals. Now, when I first read the headline about um, Alex Shelley um, and Chris Saban um, leaving TNA, the most seen guns reportedly exiting from TNA, I was I was a bit hmm. Sad about it. Well, not sad about it because I don't watch TNA regularly, but I was a bit <laughs> iffy about it. I was like, hmm, why are they leaving TNA? But then I thought, you know what? They've probably signed a lot of new talent. Maybe it's their time to move on. And Alex, um, Alex Shea and Chris Shabin have done had a, an ex- incredible tenure at TNA. But then the thing about the nature of their contracts or the nature of certain contracts in TNA did have me very intrigued. As you, as you guys may know, we spoke about TNA in depth, I think, on one of the earlier episodes of Commissioner's Corner. So let me throw this to you, Knowledge. In regards to TNA, in regards to um, the motor scene with scene guns, where do you think they'll end up next? But more importantly, what does this say about the nature of TNA's business when it comes to contracts, given that the per-appearance um, deals that they're allegedly throwing out there to talent? What that means is that, just like I said here before, they are trying to cut down on their spending um you know they've got it's a shame really because they've got these long-standing guys here at tna and you know saving and shelly i'm sure that they're used to receiving you know yearly contracts where they get their guaranteed money every single week and now they're being offered per day deals which is a significant um pay decrease um but you know i was we were on this platform talking before about the changes in TNA going forward. And I mentioned that the fella that came in to replace Damor, um, the guy from Anthem, his name was Anthony Sacconi. It was obvious to me that the reason why they brought him in was because they need to watch their bottom line because, you know, they haven't turned a profit. God knows when the last time they probably made money in that company. And I'm not, 
not knocking Scott Demore because at the end of the day, there's only so much he could do in terms of, you know, he was given a product to look after that, that um, you know, at one time was on national television. And by the time he got it, it was just, I don't even know how many networks it had gone, it had gone through from Spike to, um, to uh, what's, what's the, what did the Anthem station it's on now? So yeah, they got rid of him and they wanted to save some money. But the, the thing is though, is that they're obviously spending money on the WWE free agents that they got. Yeah. They got and they got Dolph Ziggler, you know, those guys I'm sure are on yearly deals, but in order to cut costs elsewhere, they're having to offer yeah. present talent whose deals are coming up, you know, per date deals, which, which, you know, is a shame, but it says a lot about the state of TNA because, you know, they don't draw that well. The pay-per-view buys, you know, very limited. Although the one in January, the one that Osprey was on, yeah. that, well, but that was the first one under the TNA hoopla of, mm -hmm. of of rebranding. Obviously, that meant nothing in the long run, and they're back to where they were before. Um, you know, so now it's interesting to see what happens with guys like Saban and Shelley because they obviously they could stay in TNA and they could accept those yes. per appearance deals, but. The fact that we know this information means that they're floating that information out so that they can see who, you know, is wanting their services. So, you know, this news, sorry to you off. this news is interesting because I remember, I remember during like the whole um, Osprey free agency when he was like test nights free agency. Um, it was heavily reported that TNA did have interest in him, and obviously, like we all knew that TNA probably couldn't match or even come close to the money that WWE or AW were offering Osprey, but the fact that they put their name in the in the buckets would suggest to the average person that they do some have some sort of like um financial power in this. But then obviously the reports of you know um the reason why Scott Demore left allegedly was a financial reason in terms of him he wanted um Anthem to pump more money into the product and they were refusing to do so. Mm -hmm. So this brings into question, okay, if they have the money to pump into, let's say, an Osprey, granted it wouldn't have matched WWE, but it had something to offer, why can't that same, why can't those same finances be distributed amongst the rest of the product or go into other areas of the overall TNA product? <laughs> I think um, when the, I mean, I don't know what they offered Will Osprey. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've, I've, there's rumors as to what he's on now, and there's no way TNA could ever match that. But I mean, I'm sure that they offered him money that was big, you know, for them and at this current stage of their um, of their lifespan. Why can't they spread the money around there? Eh, you know, those at the end of the day, this, I mean, the talent that they've got have been there for a while. Mm. Um, the, you know, the company's fortunes ain't going to change based on the talent that's already there. Uh, talent will be the fortunes of the company will change based on a new person coming in. Companies don't turn around, you know, with the same face as being on the roster. So where's something new that has to come in. Um, but, you know, they got, they got, what's his name? Nick Nemeth and they got Ali and that's the people that they invested their money in. You know, uh, Osprey was never going to go there, unfortunately. And neither was CM Punk. I know they were floating. Yeah, they uh, were floating. Yeah. you know the one in cm punk but that's a that's a big time money deal right there you know and also yeah the more did want them to invest more in in um the company in terms of you know better production and pyro and cameras and stuff like that but once again that is a that is a lot of money that's a lot of money when you're not earning anything when you're not bringing much in when the company's in the red you know obviously you need to invest money to make more money but it gets to a point where it's like okay we've been doing this for how many years and you know, when is this going to, when, when are we going to recoup on this? And unfortunately, Anthem, they didn't recoup. And, you know, they want TV, they want TV money. That's what they're trying to get. So I, I don't think they'll get that, but that's what they're trying to get right now. You know, I just, I look at what they're doing over there in terms of, you know, them offering per date deals. And it's obvious that they expect some of these guys to go because you can't offer guys like Saban and Shelley per date deals when you know that other companies are just going to try and swoop in and take them away. So I think they've just probably are relegated to the point that some of these guys are going to have to go at, at this stage. Yeah. You know, but but Saban and Shelley, no offense to them, they're not as, as talented as they are. They're not going to, you know, them leaving TNA isn't going to. 
make or break. No, I said no make or break. I don't know what would make or break TNA. I don't know what could hurt them or what could improve them. I'd, at this yeah, stage, they managed to stage. stick around. Like the thing about TNA, which I always like, like which I'm always like kind of impressed by, is the fact that they've stuck around so long. There's many points within their history where they were on like the brink of like completely fading out, and they've managed to you know either secure a late DVD, a TV deal. Granted, it was on like a shitty network like Destination America. They've always managed to like keep they're on their- that fishing network as well for a while. What'd you say, sir? They were on the hunting channel yeah. for a while as well. I don't remember what it was called, but they were on yeah. the hunting channel. They've, and then they've, managed the infomercial channel. they've managed to keep themselves somewhat afloat, but it does. But you mentioned like they haven't been able to turn a profit. And I will, we're, we're, in the, we're in the era where obviously WWE have the Netflix deal, AW um, very, are still um, in talks with um, Warner Discovery, and Tony Khan seems very confident in there. How. V- this is this is an abstract question, but how Luke, how viable is like wrestling to these major companies? Because we've seen AW major television dis- distributors, because we've seen WWE, you know, pretty much be on USA for a long period of time, and then now they've got the Netflix deal. Tony Khan's, even though he has the relationship, it's been hasn't. I wouldn't say it's been like the easiest of negotiations, especially we know with Ring of Honor, he tried to get. Um, Warner involved with Ring of Honor, and apparently, from all reports, they don't really have interest in Ring of Honor. How difficult it is is it for a wrestling company to secure a TV deal today? A wrestling company to secure a TV deal for a wrestling company is pretty hard, um, because of the amount of content that's already on television. At the end of the day, WWE have got three, five, they've got five hours on cable television every week, and they've got two hours on national TV as well. That's seven hours of first run content. AEW have got two, three, they got five hours on a first run television on national television. That is a lot of pro wrestling. That is a lot. I can't even, I don't watch WWE. I watch AEW and I don't even watch five hours a week of AEW. Yeah. I, just, I just don't have the time and I don't have the, I just don't have it in me. Like you can see what the leftover, um, the amount of time that wrestling fans have left lo- have left over is probably the TNA number that we see every week, which is like 80,000 people. You know, that's what's left. So, you know, if AEW want more content, I'm sure that it's probably not that, it probably won't be that difficult for them to get another hour or whatever. And if WWE wanted to get another hour of television, they could probably get it as well because those are guys that have proven track records in terms of delivering consistent viewership numbers mm-hmm. cable television has fallen i mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on this show and pro wrestling is one of the only things that can draw a consistent tv rating minus the N- minus the nba and the nfl right. you know and tv shows like um you know uh the shows the um what do you call them the housewife shows yeah and uh, survivor and what's the other one uh that did really well um vanderpump I know that 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 does really well, but wrestling, AEW and WWE, they draw consistently good TV numbers. So, you know, pro wrestling as a whole is a successful television property, but those two companies, everything mm-hmm. else, I think you're going to struggle getting them on TV because by the end of the day, you can look at what TNA gets on their network now. Them going to another network with even more distribution isn't good. They're not going to do anything else because people prefer to watch other companies. They prefer to watch NXT on a Tuesday or... um or dynamite on a wednesday you know well like i said there's only so much time wrestling fans have there's only so much time look at the nxt number on wednesdays about seven hundred thousand people seven hundred thousand wwe fans watch that show i'd like to think that that's the hardest of the hardcore of wwe fans that step in and watch that show um compare that number to the raw number and it's night and day really so you put tna on in that plat on that same platform, I don't even know what it would do, but it wouldn't get as much as TNA. Probably wouldn't get half that. I mean, it wouldn't get as half as NXT. I don't think it would. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and I'll see you like where where do you see these guys ending up? That's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, they could end up in New Japan. New Japan need foreign talent, like full time foreign talent. I don't know if the money is there in New Japan. <laughs> I mean, doing the research for the show that we were supposed to do today has got me thinking. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I don't know if they've got it, but um, that would be interesting for them. I personally see them going to AEW. 
Um, I think that those are two guys that are older now, really good workers. I, I think that Tony Khan would probably bring them in. They've got a lot of supporters in the, in the AEW dressing room. And also, they're a really good team to have on the roster. You know, mm-hmm. they can produce great matches on your TV every week as well. They don't have a problem with putting guys over. I'm not saying they should be tag team champions, but they definitely got a spot on the on the AEW roster. I mean, Triple H could want them. He's used them before, but they're older. I mean, you could put them in NXT and have them work with the younger talent and stuff like that. But I just look at them as two guys that they don't work the house style. I don't think the NXT guys will probably work with them anywhere. I know Saban and Shelley could probably could probably dumb down, but. I, I don't see it. I don't see it all. What do you think? I don't think... Obviously, I think AEW is probably, like, the easiest, like, transition. Um, but I wouldn't... Like, if they end up in WWE, I wouldn't be surprised. Either. Like, it's not out of the question for me. No, it's not out of the question at all. No, just because be I feel like... Yeah, just because I feel like... Um, I don't watch TNA regularly, so I don't... But I've heard from, like, the, um, the TNA, like... Um, uh, people that watch TNA regularly that they've been putting on good matches, um, even even as singles competitors. But I don't think that that is the stage in their career where they really care to have like the oh my god five star classic matches. I feel like they've they've kind of like they're comfortable being the elder statesman. So I, I don't I, I can see them going to WWE earning a ton of money and just like living. I don't, think I don't think they get a ton of money to work. Well, I think relative to what they'd get in TNA, I think... Oh, that's different. <laughs> yeah, re- yeah, I think re- like a ton of money relative to what they'd be getting in TNA. I think whatever they get in WWE would be a significant increase, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't, like, if they were to be in WWE, like, I wouldn't be surprised. In AEW, this isn't... The AEW tag team division does need some sort of revitalization. It does. Um, but... And this is no disrespect to the Boat City Machine Guns in terms of like their acumen as an actual tag team, because as in those rings, they are an incredible team. Um, they they're just not names that for me I'm like, oh my god, these are must sign tag teams. But if AEW oh, sign them, yeah, I agree. I'm like, cool. If they don't sign them, I'm like, fair play. But I want these guys to get I I'm at I'm at the stage where I want a lot of the veterans to get paid. Um I'm happy that I'm seeing guys like AJ, Joe even Punk to a degree, Danielson, like, all getting, like, these massive checks because, like, these men, like, basically carried the U.S. independence scene on their on their backs for, for like, the, the early 2000s. So, I'm pioneering. Yeah, Samoa Joe had, eh? Yeah, phenomenal. <laughs> he that was, was really finished. He was, we were pretty much retired uh, a couple yeah, of years ago. Oh, I, used to be, I used to be on the main pod, like, screaming, like, he's washed, he's quotes. Wow. Oh, I thought he was as well. I thought he was as well. <laughs> That I thought he was like I will never forget that that he had a match of Carrion Cross on NXT. That I, and I granted it was Carrion Cross, but like Samojo was like like bad out of shape. Um, um, yeah. In term in terms of free agents, the the probably the only must sign tag team. Like in in terms of like tag teams, absolutely. In terms of like the quality of tag teams, absolutely. Those guys are them but it just in terms of maybe it's just because of my like jaded um feel towards like the aw tag team division but for me it's just like i don't know i don't know i don't know because because realistically speaking how i feel they're going to be positioned is a veteran tag team versus being like one of lethal. yeah like how i would want them to be, be positioned yeah as probably like the top top guy one of some of the top guys in the division how I feel they're going to be positioned as a veteran tag team that collects a couple wins and rampage has a few title shots, but doesn't really do anything. That's that's not a discredit to them. That's more how I feel they'll be positioned. Yeah, I'm looking at that um, that AEW tag title tournament. Um, I'm just looking at the grid. I mean, it's like you look at the grid, and you're going to see. <laughs> it's like you can just book that out yourself, and you can see exactly where it's going. But the the teams in there, they're just so, I don't know, AEW have got some great tag teams and they've got so many great combinations that they can put together as well. And then you look at that tournament and it's just a bit like, oh, so that's it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, big up Johnny Too Hotty. Joe was finished. 
He was finished. Yep, his latest revitalization made me want to put him in the top five best AW signings. They didn't want to use him. He was done. They wouldn't use him anymore. Like he was in. He was working in Florida. Was part of Triple H's recruitment team. Him and Regal. They were Triple H guys. Yeah. And then Vince fired him twice. <laughs> yeah. the first time, Vince yeah, fired like, him. I said based on this performance I saw in NXT, I was like, yeah, like I, I love Joe. Joe's like in my personal like top ten favorite wrestlers. He ever. worked with Killer Cross though, and that guy fucking sucks, bro. Like he I don't did, know, he's he, not. He Joe did. isn't Chris Benoit or somebody, you know. Was like, he did, <laughs> but Joe was literally like panting for air. Like it yeah. was, but like it was, it was, but it like. The, it wasn't even the quality of the match. It was just like looking at Joe in isolation. He was like panting for air. Like he was, he he looked out of it. And I was like, oh. I wasn't keen on him. I wasn't keen on Joe coming into AEW. He was one of the guys that I was wrong about. Um, yeah. He was one of the signings where I was like, really? Like, would you need this guy? Not that I don't like Joe. I like Joe. But it gets to a point where it's like, how much how much more room is in the inn sort of thing for him and John Morrison and... Uh, you know, who's the other one? Uh, even Adam Copeland, I was wrong about him. I was wrong about Claudio, too. I never, I, I said they shouldn't sign Claudio, but he's been hell of a fun fact. If you, if you fun fact for the guys in the chat, if you hear so, if you, if you hear some of the voice notes knowledge sent me about half of these guys, they're hilarious. <laughs> like, it is hilarious content. That I remember when Claudio signed, he was like, <laughs> it was just like a five minute voice note saying, I don't know why Tony Khan is doing this. <laughs> I was wrong. I, I saw the guy for years in WWE and he was fine. But um, who cares? How many other guys can you get in, you know, that are you know just as good? But he, he's really worked. The guy's worked hard. He's a fucking really good wrestler. I just want to say I've got a match on right now. Sting against Lex Luger from 1989. Um, I'm looking at Luger here. This guy's physique is absolutely this insane. Like it's crazy watching these old matches because I cannot believe that they let that man go out there looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> he just looks huge, like it's crazy how muscular this guy is. But yeah, um, in terms of like, just just a, this is a sad sad point, but it just got me thinking. Like I mentioned, I mentioned like just the crop of talent that came from like the mid early to mid two thousands that are now like top guys in wrestling or topish guys in wrestling is pretty astounding. Like that generation really like, I think we. Yeah. Because a lot of them are still active, it's easy. It's, 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 we don't really go back and see like how these men literally changed the industry, um, in certain in certain facets. And yeah, it's just it's it's just crazy like how much how important that era was. And uh, and that's what I think of when I think about the independence. Would independence ever get back to that point? I don't know. There are several different factors. Um, but it's just interesting to see like how much how much talent came from like a certain generation and certain pool from the independence. But yeah, that's a quick oh, yeah. um yeah. Oh, yeah. That's hey, a Punk, quick... Joe, Danielson, AJ. Guys are still on TV now. Yeah, Some guys. of them are still really good. Some of them are still really good. Like, yeah. I mean, you can say what you want about punk, but I mean, God, the guy is still an Draw. incredible promo. Incredible yeah. promo, you know. Draw. I, I mean, he's washed. But I mean, he's got enough. He's got enough. I think if you put Punk in there with someone who's like, I don't know, someone who can really just lay out a, like lay out a mat, like um, it's funny I say this, like Matt Jackson. <laughs> the first person I thought of was Matt Jackson in terms of laying out a perfect match. I think him and Punk would have had a good match. <laughs> just because like, I think Matt would have led him, would have laid that match out. He would have found everything that Punk was good at, and he would have worked off. He would have worked. His ass off for Punk. Someone like Danielson, I don't think that would work for Punk. Like I think Danielson works way too hard, like yeah. for a guy like Punk at this yeah. stage. So moving on, we are going to be talking about WWE specifically. Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey had some very interesting remarks about um, WWE and Vince McMahon. Um, and she said, so I'm going to read a few quotes. These are from the Wrestling Observer. But she did the interview with, I believe, the publication Cage Side Seats. But um, obviously, I'm taking these quotes from the Wrestling Observer. Um, one, of the, one of the main headline quotes was, Vincent Mann was never gone while I was there. He was just phoning it in through Bruce Pritchard. My agent who works at WWE, Endeavor, 
he was telling me, you know, he's completely gone, I swear. And I'm like, I'll believe it when I see it. Because everyone said he left before, he never left. He was there by text message. And she went, she further went on to say, um, speak about her time and treatment in WWE. Um, she There's another quote saying, I just didn't want to be Vince's fucking action figure anymore. I felt like I was doing custom matches for a fucking sicko in the back. All the power to the girls who keep fighting the good fight, but I'm in my mid-30s. I've got other shit to do. And she basically... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh, yeah the article the, art, the the interview itself um, she speaks kindly on Triple H she says um, she wishes that she was a part of the regime when Triple H finally took over um, she was just more so um, putting out her creative um, frustrations with the product um, saying that you know not a lot of time was dedicated to her compared to um, someone like a Roman or someone like even a Logan Paul you could see that you know, there was a lot of time and effort put into those people. There's multiple, there's multiple questions to ask. Obviously, at first, the Vince, the, the Vince stuff. It was very obvious, I think, at the time when Vince left, that his fingerprints were still in the company. Um, that he was not going down without a fight. And I think for it, it took again, like a nut, like it took the lawsuit being out there and like things being cranked up to 11 for him to find for Tico to finally wash their hands of him um but, but in regards to Vince how what do you think was the prime because the investigation so the lawsuit happened Vince obviously resigned quote unquote on paper from the company that guess happened resigned quote unquote from the company but then he miraculously made a comeback when, you know, um, the whole Endeavor TKO uh, merger was happening. What my, my, my biggest question is obviously the reporting on the lawsuit increased, like the um, publicity increased. But what was it that fight was the nail in the coffin for him? Because these, these weren't new allegations that were brought up. It was just further embellishing the old allegations that were previously there before. So what 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 was the difference between him sneaking back into the company and TKL finally washing their hands of it? Um, what happened was was the details of the actual Janelle Grant lawsuit mm. became public. Before then, it was just I say just before then it was um, you know last year it was just you know he's been alleged of he's been you know there was accusations of him being a sex pest. You know, yeah. and um, but we didn't really know many details on it. We knew that he had paid uh, what was how much money was it? it was eighteen million? He paid eighteen million dollars worth of money out to various women over the years. Um, you know, there was a lady in the tanning salon who he took his he took his dick out and and she you know he gave <laughs> there there was that there was that money. There was um, uh, an ex WWE employee who he gave seven and a half million to general grant got three so there was there was all this money that he'd been given out to people but like i said at the time we didn't really know the ins and outs of these allegations we just knew that he was accused of being a sex pest and him and ace he was sleeping with someone and apparently him and ace were sharing women that's what we knew at the time and then you know he resigned from the board and he went home and then because he was still the chairman of the company, he managed to get himself back on the board by firing board members, and he replaced those board mm -hmm. members with people that were with board members that he knew that they would they would um, take his side on any of these issues. So I mean, it's funny because when he tried to get back on the board, you know, all of those people, every single one of them, had voted no. There wasn't a single one of them that voted yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I assume that. You know, there's Triple H and Nick Khan, Stephanie, they all voted no for him to come back. And um, they would have known more about the allegations than than us. They would have probably known the full extent of what was going on, which is probably the reason why they said no. He can't come back. As soon as he did his, um, what show is it, his succession-style power play, and he, <laughs> he he got rid of board members and he replaced them, you know, yeah. Stephanie left, and then you had a few other board members that didn't want him they just they just wanted out they didn't want to be associated with this man in any way we had three board members leave 
and one of them being his daughter she was like fuck this i'm getting out of here i don't want to i don't want to be associated with this guy so he comes back and you know at this stage everyone votes him back because you know as you've seen in sex session you can't really you no. just got to go with the grain really in these instances and yeah. you can't be seen to be publicly against somebody but then when the lawsuit came out and it was public and we saw what the full extent of this was where it would be uh, yeah I think the worst thing that came out, I mean, amongst all, I think those text messages were so damning. Yeah, those text messages. Uh, those well, text messages were so damning. I mean, you can... I've seen people try and defend Vince McMahon um, for whatever reason. Some people that work in the company and, you know, some of his his fans that grew up watching his stuff on TV. Um, okay, you can defend him and stuff but what you cannot defend is those text messages because you can't say that he you know he didn't do anything because those text messages were so brutal they were vile yeah I mean, um, they really were. and just a bit of context for the, for those who have or have not read the lawsuit um the lawsuit um mentions made reference to several wwe corporate officers now to be clear um these corporate officers that were mentioned within the lawsuits were not mentioned to say that they participated in the acts that Vince McMahon committed. Mm -hmm. It was more so the corporate officers were mentioned as people who had, who potentially knew or potentially would have information about the ongoings in the office. Yes. Um, and then um, most recently, I think though, I think it was by Brandon Thurston, I believe. Um, yeah. And um, he um, did some digging and managed to get the names of the corporate officers. So within the lawsuit itself, there is no explicit name stated. Um, executives, people... Well, there are a couple. There are a couple names there are, stated. Yes. Uh, outside of Vince, um, John Laurinaitis... Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie's name's in there. Stephanie's name is in there. But mm -hmm. some of the corporate... So some of the, the corporate officers that, whose names we are about to say weren't explicitly stated in the lawsuit but further um, information has been found that basically reveals who these people are. Mm -hmm. um, so corporate officers number one and number two um, are WWE President Nick Khan and um, COO Brad Bloom. And I believe um, Stephanie was referenced. Stephanie, as... Stephanie is corporate officer number three, number although three. her name is actually listed in the lawsuit. But mm. for whatever reason, I don't know why. She's also listed as corporate officer number three. Who's corporate officer number four again? Remind me. Oh, I think is isn't it a producer? It's it's the guy that was um it was the the guy that was managing her, the guy that interviewed her. And yeah. He, asked questions. Yeah. he was just told to give it's like he was just told to give her a job. Yes, let me see. Let me see. Um, but yeah, these corporate officers were obviously um I believe Brian Nurse. There you go, nurse. Brian so he was, nurse. Yeah, so he was the guy who um, he was the guy that, who had to interview her. Vince got her an interview, and she had two interviews with this guy. He didn't offer, he didn't ask her any questions. And um, when she was working with him, he wouldn't speak to her. And at times, he'd see her walking down the hall, and when he saw her, he'd turn around and he'd walk the other way. I think looking at it as someone who I don't want to say, I've, I, I haven't been in that position, but I've had to work with like owners of the company their kids and their wives and stuff like that and um i do understand the awkwardness of having to work with somebody because your boss wants them there so yeah. you know i do get that but especially when you have to manage somebody and you can't really manage them because your boss has said that this is it for them so I, <laughs> they're here there's nothing you can do really but um but yeah i mean i mean more is going to come out about this i mean there's yeah, going to be sure. so much more you know, there's all these other stuff. I mean, I see, I hear stories about this every week. Uh, some yeah. stuff dating back to the eighties, you know, and the previous um, the previous case that Vince had, um, you know, in the early nineties and stuff, and all the accusations about the child sex trafficking and stuff. You know, it's all coming back. It's all coming back. And really, I mean, what Ronda was talking about because Ronda's got the book coming out. It's called Our Fight. It's okay. a part two of our memoir. And I suppose, because it's not out yet, I mean, I've got the first book. I never read it, though. <laughs> I've got, but I'll, I'm sure I'll get the second one. But from what I understand, a lot of it is to do with her WWE run. Mm. And, um, I mean, she talks about Ace and she talks about Bruce and, you know, the fact that, you know, they're pieces of shit and stuff like that. But 
but I mean, and also Vince, you know, she goes, apparently she goes into a lot of in-depth talk about Vince McMahon. I, I believe it was written before all of this came out though. Okay. At least the full details came yeah. out. So I don't think that would be mentioned in it. But I think um, I could imagine someone like Ronda Rousey being absolutely dis despised by someone like Ace. Just, you know, just the way that she is. Oh, she's yeah. so outspoken, especially about about leering men and stuff like that. I can imagine that she would have really hated working with Ace and, and, and Bruce yeah. Pritchard. Um, and also, I mean, Rousey demands respect everywhere she goes. Ronda Rousey done a lot for women's combat sport, just women's sports in general. I kind of feel like it, I don't want to say it, when I see WWE fans, um, when I see WWE fans um, mocking Ronda Rousey and, you know, saying bad stuff about her, yeah, I get it. She went on TV. You could see that she did not want to be there, that last run. I mean, when I watched her, you could see she did not want to be there. But at the same time, she'd done so much for women's sports. I tell you what, that whole period when she was, <laughs> you know, the biggest star in the UFC, that was a, a run. That was such a yeah. fun time to be a UFC fan, especially when she came in and all of those journalists and all the other fighters that didn't they, they thought that she was going to flop i remember that first show that she main evented in um i think it was in san jose and she fought um who did she fight was it Mish it was liz carmouche no that was Mish take came up it was liz carmouche she fought and they main evented the show and i remember the articles and the journalists they were saying that she shouldn't be headlining shows people don't want to see women uh, in these positions, and you know, Dan Henderson was on the show. I think he fought Mach um, Leota Machida on the undercard, and people were saying that oh, that should have been the main event. And you know, and then the show did really well. She came. I remember she came out, and the place exploded. She was the most over person on the show. And even when the number came in, I remember these journalists saying, "Oh, you know, Machida and Dan Henderson drew the number. She had nothing to do." Even after she had success, they were still shitting on her. And the yeah. truth is, is that anyone that said she wasn't going to get success, she'd already proven it in Strike Force. We already saw that Cyborg, um, Chris Cyborg and um, Gina Carano, they did massive numbers on Showtime. And then Rousey came after and her and Misha Tate had that that blood feud <laughs> on sh on Showtime television. It was fantastic. So, yeah. you know, she'd done a lot for women's sports. And, you know, you can talk a lot about her personality and stuff like that. That's one thing, but... Ugh. She for a, for a short period of time she was a an icon in women's she, sports. Not just not just the women's sports, but like in sporting. I remember Ronda Rousey at her heyday. Like there would be like there. I remember like it's it's stupid to look back on it now because but there'd be sports like um so there, there'd be shows like First Take, one of the like leading sports shows in America, talking about whether she'd beat up Floyd Mayweather. Now <laughs> like the, the topic of conversation is like is 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 silly, but it was yeah. just like. The amount Ronda at her peak, I think a lot of people look at Connor when it comes to like the mega, um, you know, combat sports star, which he, he became to be. But before Connor, it was really Ronda. Ronda was carrying like selling these pay per views on her back. And with UFC, like, there are with UFC, like, the pay per view numbers are there, like, the pay per view numbers are absolutely there. So, Ronda at, at her peak was one of, forget male, forget female, was one of the biggest sporting stars in the world. She was on the cover covers of um, ESPN yeah. magazine. She won ESPYs. Like, she was she was in movies. She was in, like, billion-dollar gross in movies like Fast and the Furious, heavily featured in the marketing, not just in a random cameo role, like, within the trailers themselves. Um, there was a whole part of, like, the Entourage movie where, like, the joke is... One of the characters has to fight Ronda Rousey. Like Ronda Rousey was an absolute like met. Like you, we throw around the word megastar, but she was truly a yeah, megastar, was, yeah. absolute megastar. And when, and when they got her, and when WWE got her, she, it was a big deal. Yeah. It was a really big deal. I was, I, they had me watching WWE when she was in the company because I was a big Ronda Rousey fan, but. Um, the way they presented that wasn't for me. So I was a bit disappointed with the whole run that she had there. But them getting her, that was a massive deal at the time. They got on Fox TV because of Ronda Rousey. That yeah. was the reason they she was the catalyst for their Fox deal was Ronda Rousey. And Brock Lesnar to a lesser extent too, because um, she took over from Brock. Because when Brock left UFC, she pretty much 
took that yeah, mantle the main of being, draw. Yeah, she took that mantle of being their main draw. And then by the time she was done, by the time she lost to uh, Nunes, um, and her comeback. Was, yeah, yeah. That, that comeback fight she had against Amanda Nunes, by the time that she had that fight, Connor was already. Yeah, the, the next one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's a shit. The Ronda Rousey story was a shame because she, um, I don't know, I think Ronda Rousey is a great example of um, an MMA fighter who just believed her own hype. She thought she could box, which she couldn't box. But that's <laughs> she, 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 uh, you know, uh, there was after she lost to um, Holly Holm, there was so much falsehoods out there about her, um, about her record. This happens anyway in any sport. Anytime someone is really successful and they lose, you always have the people coming out and saying, "Oh, you know, she was never. He was never really that good." <laughs> or, um, you know, it's always the case. But when she lost, it was just, "Oh, you know, she didn't fight anybody, and she, you know, she just beat easy. She beat shitty fighters, and it, that's that's so unfair to those fighters and her because she beat really good fighters and she beat them quickly. She would beat them all in the first round. But you can't call Liz Carmouche and Misha Tate, and you know, but they were." Cool. Uh, but Betch Kohea, you're talking about some really good fighters at that time, you know. And really and truly, she should have beat Holly Holm. I don't know why you get in there with a boxer and box. You're a judo, you're a judoka. <laughs> she went in there and she she done, you know, she was also a great example of someone who never seemed to change her game. She this she never really progressed beyond the judo. Yeah. She never worked with she she never really had anyone other than that. She had the same trainer for all those years. And she never moved on to get to to improve her skill set. It just never happened for her. And then yeah. when she came back with Nunes, I remember thinking, okay, if she just sticks to the judo, you know, she she might have a chance. And then what did she do? <laughs> yeah, and that's just, uh, you know, but, but yeah, um, yeah. Circling back to the double, I wanted to ask um, about like the the lawsuit quickly before we move on. Obviously, within the lawsuit itself, WWE is not. I think a lot of people are under the um, assumption that the lawsuit is only suing Vince McMahon. Um, when the lawsuit it's pretty much, yeah, it's, it's suing the company, mm -hmm. um, which obviously has massive ramifications given the fact that now you know the, the current CEO has been like publicly named now explicitly. Mm -hmm. What what how how would WWE first of all go back but go by combating this and what how do you foresee the next let's say yeah just how how would you foresee the next now couple months to a year going in regards to this lawsuit now that you know you know it's the lawsuit, not going to court yeah it's not going to court they'll settle okay. they'll this will go away because they do not want they're not going to want any of this coming out anymore i should say coming out and then once you settle there you set a president you set a precedent that you're going to settle in any of these instances so any person who comes out and sues the company and vince at this stage has got a good chance of a settlement and mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of them there's going to be a lot dude you gotta understand i heard stories about vince McMahon for years and i didn't even work there i was just <laughs> i'm just through the grapevine hearing these stories and you know you there's gonna, there's a lot that's gonna come out about Vince McMahon. I'm not even talking about women. I'm talking about, you know, these ring boys from the late '80s, early '90s, who, you know, who work for the company, and they were abused by Vince's input. They were abused by Vince's management team, and he, he knew. That's always been a story: is that he knew and he did nothing about it. He fired Mel Phillips. Mel Phillips was a legendary pedophile and wrestler, just like and vile man and he worked for the wwe for years and vince did fire him because um you know mel had a reputation for liking little boys and playing with their feet that was his that was his thing he used to play with little boys feet Triple and um, go to their hotel you know the ring crew the ring boys he'd go to their um hotel rooms and he'd, he'd do weird he's a weird guy and it got too much accusations were flying all over the place for years and years and years. They used to make jokes about Mel Phillips on television. You go back and watch those old challenge shows and stuff, and Mel Phillips was the ring announcer. You'd hear Vince and Gorilla and Jesse and all these guys making jokes about Mel Phillips liking feet and stuff like that. But Vince fired him, but then he brought him back. And one of the conditions of him being brought back was that he stayed away from the kids. It's like, <laughs> and obviously he didn't. 
he didn't. And he stayed there for years with more accusations and more accusations. And, you know, he fired him in 91. But these accusations have been going on, what, a decade? Mm. You know, and everyone, he wasn't the only one. There was Terry Garvin was another one who used to do the same thing. And, you know, I mean, people like Pat Patterson, but I mean, he was accusations about Pat Patterson for years and years and years as well, doing all sorts of stuff. And Vince did nothing about it. Nothing about it. Would you? So, I, I, it's unfortunate. I wish I had the quote, but uh, Randy Orton's uncle Barry was one of the guys that Terry Garvin um, used to harass. Actually, Barry O, his name was Barry Orton. His name is actually Randy Orton, though. His real name is actually Randy Orton. His, oh, wow. Yeah, Randy Randall Barry Orton was Barry O's real name, but he had, um, yeah, but Terry Garvin used to harass him and he said Patterson harassed him as well. It's the reason why he quit the company was because he couldn't take the harassment because they're always trying to, you know, the whole thing of, um, oh, you know, come up to my room, we'll do whatever and we'll give you a push. <laughs> we'll give you a push. And, you know, these dozens of wrestlers will tell you stories about that stuff from those people in particular. Yeah. But yeah, I see. So, but do you expect, like, as you said, there's going to be a lot of settlements um going forward i remember um janelle uh, miss grant's lawyer um said that she you know had been contacted by other people you know who'd worked um with yeah. vince um do you expect more lawsuits to come to the fold publicly or do you yeah. think they're gonna, do you think there's just going to be situations where you know it's going to be handled behind the scenes backstage because surprisingly this hasn't hurt WWE's PR as much as something like this would. I don't, think, I don't think anything could hurt that company at this point. Mm. I really don't. I think in the early 90s when the the sex scandals came out, I think they weren't a part of pop culture to the point where yeah. they could withstand that. You know, the whole steroid scandal and the, the Ring Boy scandal really hurt them for years and years and years. It hurt yeah. them so much. Hogan left um, to protect himself. <laughs> He left, you know, because he didn't want to be associated with any of that. And, um, you know, just get away from the company for a bit. And um, he came back when the heat had died down. But their business went down for years because they were in a position where they could not withstand all that negative publicity. But then, you know, they withstood all that. They withstood the storm. They came back stronger than ever years later. I mean, obviously, they had some lean years, but they nearly even went out. They nearly, um, no, don't want to say they nearly went out of business, but. Vince was even considering selling parts of the company off um, mm. to keep it going in 97. But they stayed strong and Austin Rock, McMahon and all this stuff, and they got stronger than ever. So by the time Chris Benoit killed his family, like, that didn't even hurt them that much. You know, and you'd think, you'd think about that. you think about a main event pro wrestler doing what he done, and you'd think that would hurt them, and it really didn't. So now, you know... Vincent Mann, the Jim Henson of pro wrestling, whoever does this, you know, their fans don't, fans didn't care. Do you know what this reminds me of? Um, not, not even to make light of the situation, but just like as a, like I said, I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you are a fan of pro wrestling, you need to watch Succession. Um, I'm saying to everyone in the comments, you need to watch Succession. But this reminds me of the um, Succession, the whole boat scandal, the whole cruises scandal. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's literally like word for word the cruiser scandal. Um, yeah. no real people involved. That line just is in my head whenever I think about stuff like this. But um, I need but, to watch that again. Yeah, I do. I really. Yeah, do. I need to just put that on in the evenings when I'm just doing bits and just have that on in the background. What a show! Absolutely yeah. fantastic show. But um, and the beginning, on. the first season, um, with the the car and the remember the yeah, Scotland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the cover up. Awesome. Oh, awesome stuff! Remind, oh, uh, uh, but it reminds me of a certain uh, Superfly wrestler. But anyways, um, <laughs> there's a lot of cover ups in wrestling. But yeah, yeah. But uh, before before we end off, um, let's talk about AW briefly. Um, well, there's actually a lot to talk about AW. Um, Dan, let's talk about Jack Perry. Jack Perry. Jack hey. Perry's obviously been in, in New Japan. Um, he was Jack Perry was originally suspended for the incident he had with uh, CM Punk 
at all in. You know, um, they, you know, I'm sure you've heard reports of them getting to a backstage scuffle, um, Never which, <laughs> which, which resulted in the firing of CM Punk and the suspension of Jack Perry. Now, according to several reports online, this, this is something I, I, I had actually heard before about Tony Khan being very... You, you told me this ages ago, I remember. Yeah, about Tony Khan being very displeased with um, Jack Perry. Mm -hmm. um, and which resulted in him basically being sent off to New Japan. And it got to the point, allegedly, where Jack Perry handed in his release and Tony Khan declined. Now, how long do you think... Now, do you view this New Japan exile as like a punishment? Or do you think it's a thing where people are making a mountain out of a molehill and Jack Perry and Tony Khan's relationship are just perfectly fine? Um, I don't know if the relationship is perfectly fine. And the reason why I say that is because if you read these reports, mm -hmm. and I think Dave, last week, Dave, what you told me months yeah. ago, Dave came out and publicly pretty much said the same thing you did. He said that... Uh, what did Dave say? I'm trying to remember. There's been so much information. Dave came out and said that AEW um, were, you know, pissed off at Jack Perry and he's been suspended. He wants to come back to work. Tony Khan still pissed with him because he got CM Punk fired. It's pretty much what Dave said. Yeah. Apparently, Jack has apologized and you know it's still not. It's still not. Still not there. But then that was maybe Tuesday, or Wednesday, and on Friday, Dave. In the Observer wrote that, um, yeah, you know, TK is, what did he say? He said that TK and uh, Gato had been working with this thing with Jack Perry for a while. And apparently Jack Perry has apologized to Tony Khan a few times. He wants to come back to work. Um, Tony Khan hasn't committed to anything yet. And I assume that Dave said this because I'm assuming that Tony Khan reached out and told him this so that mm -hmm. he was able to put that in the Observer. Now, the same day, Jack Perry, Brian Alvarez came out later on the day and had a completely different story saying that he never apologized to Tony Khan. He asked for his release. And um, so Brian saying this, you know, that he never apologized to Tony Khan. He wanted his release. And uh, he also said that while Khan and Gato had worked out him going to New Japan, apparently everything that he does in New Japan is isn't authorized by AEW and he has no plans or there are no immediate plans for him to return to AEW. That's what he said to Brian Alvarez. Um, well, I say that that's what Brian Alvarez reported, but I'm assuming that Jack Perry told Brian that because they've had a relationship for years. So I assume that Jack reached out to him. I think that a lot of that, a lot of those, both of those reports are true in mm. terms of, if you look at the way AEW handled these situations, um, even if you go back to the incident with the Bucks and and um, and uh, and Punk, what happened there? Everyone got suspended and they got sent home. And AEW, from what I understand, didn't con they didn't speak to them. <laughs> he didn't speak to them for ages and ages and ages. He just lets them sit out there, and um, you know he handles it for his legal team, which you know is whatever, fine. But when Jack Perry said that, he said that um, he was sent home and. He never contacted Tony Khan. Never contacted him. I believe that to be true. You know, he says he never apologized. I don't know if that's true or not. He, he might have. He may not have. Um, what I do believe, though, is that it was reported that he was going to come back in December, and then Tony changed his mind because Punk showed up at Survivor Series and he was pissed. All right. <laughs> now, I believe that because. I just don't understand. Here's the thing, all right? If you think about what happened, it wasn't that bad. No. For him to be gone for this long. They had a fight. Wrestlers have fights all the time. There are wrestlers that have fights that we don't even hear about. Yeah. Um, Heck, well, um, Eddie Kingston and Eddie Kingston punched Sammy Guevara in the face. Eddie, Eddie, yeah, <laughs> Eddie and Sammy. Great example. I didn't hear about that for ages until after it happened. And, you know, what was the other one? Um, there's probably, I just don't remember right now, but there's probably yeah. loads of fights that happen all over in every company. We just don't hear about them. Um, but if you think about it, what did he do? He got in a fight with CM Punk, all right? Now, Tony fired Punk. He had no option. Did he want to? I can bet he didn't. 
no way he wanted to fire Punky. SDK says not... uh, Sammy and Andrade. Sammy and Andrade too, but that came out though. Yeah, and uh, big up Navy. I'm seeing your comments. Big up Navy. Hope you're doing hey, well, Navy. bro. Um, Roman and Kevin's recently had a little issue as well. Yeah, I did hear about that, but I don't. I don't know the full extent of that. I didn't really bother to find out. But if you think about, it, all right, let's talk about this. All right, so what did that incident that happened? It happened seven months ago, bro. Seven months ago, right? If he was going to come back in December, fine. Punk comes, goes to WWE, and Tony's pissed. You know what? I hear it. I think Tony fired Punk just because he had to. He probably would need to bring him back at some point when the heat died down. Because, I mean, he probably didn't think that he'd go back to WWE. I'm sure that Punk for years had been shitting on WWE for to Tony, so why would he go back there? But he's gone back, right? But the issue that I've got now is that we're still talking about this seven months later. If Tony okay. Khan would have brought Punk back in December, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Like, it would be over. Like, there'd be no more speculation. We wouldn't have to be talking about this nonsense from Wembley ever again. Punk, it, Jack Perry would have come back. He would have been booed. Jack Perry's situation isn't that... Wasn't it wasn't that deep. That deep. I agree. It's... It wasn't that deep. He would have come back, been booed for a little bit, and he would have moved on. Everyone would have moved on. Look at the Bucks. Last year, the Bucks were... The most... <laughs> Was the that? most hated tag team. <laughs> yeah, but it was a 50-50 thing with the Bucks a lot of the time. You know, some fans were booing them, some fans were cheering them. But now, look at look what they've done. They've turned that all around. They've got this gimmick, which, you know, people think they you know, I've seen people, they actually think this is a shoot. This is what they think the Bucks are really like. But you see the Bucks come out there with Okada and stuff. They're so dissociated from any of that stuff with Punk now because it's been long enough. It's been long enough. We've moved on and they've moved on. And this is where we're at. Jack Perry, seven months and he's still not back. So when he comes back at some point, is it, this going to be, we're going to start this whole process over again. You know, I, I do believe that he lied. Um, I say lied. He was working when he said they've got no plans to bring him back. It's obvious that, you know, New Japan and AEW have been going over this stuff. But put it this way, what I was saying earlier on about me going through New Japan's numbers and stuff like that in, pre in pre um, preparation for this show that we're supposed to do over New Japan really showed me how important that AEW relationship is to New Japan. And mm. there is no way in hell New Japan would allow Jack Perry to go out there on television and tear up his contract and then be cutting the promos that he's cutting without Tony Khan's approval because that would be insane. And also, him, the Bucks. I told you a while ago that I heard that the Bucks um, and Jack and Jack Perry were supposed to be aligned on TV. Do you remember I told you this um, yeah. a while yeah. ago? And it seems to be, that still seems to be the direction because I see them on social media. I hear Jack Perry's interviews. I'm like, okay, this is obviously still the plan at some point for when he comes back. I personally think that, all right, there's a bit of truth in everyone's stories here. I do believe that Tony Khan never reached out to Jack Perry throughout the whole period. I, I do believe that he was pissed at Jack Perry for having CM Punk fired, but at the same time, I do think that he's going to be back on TV at some point, probably after the Chicago show. Let him go out there in the, on the New Japan show in Chicago. Let him get booed out the building. Let them people get it all off of their chest. Then bring him back on Dynamite, put him with the Bucks, and let's just move on. We just need to move on. Yeah, I feel I've yeah I feel a, a Jack Perry return is imminent because I think if Tony really wanted to wash his hands of him, he'd let him just sit and waste away. Yeah. Um, he'd let so the fact that like, like yeah it's kind of okay get out of my sight for now, and then eventually he'll be back. Now, do I think Jack Perry is gonna be pushed the way he was pushed? I don't know. That that remains to be seen. That remains to be seen, but. I will say this, though. Despite Jack Perry um, being away from the company, he's still more relevant than Sammy Guevara, which is interesting. <laughs> What's that? that came out of nowhere. <laughs> it's the truth, though. Like, I'm, it was just a random... It's just the truth. Like, I, like I'm, I'm, it's, I like Sammy a lot, but it's just... I don't know. I, 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 I'm more worried for Sammy than I am for Jack Perry because at least Jack Perry has a direction coming back. Just be a just be a heel that attracts heat. Do you know what the Sammy Sam um Sammy Guevara is another one who from what I understand no one from the company's reached out to him. Like oh yeah because of the he's suspended and yeah, um suspended. that's what I heard through the grapevine. He's going whatever that 
Jack Perry has said and what the stuff with the Bucks from a couple of years ago when they were suspended, apparently the same thing is going on with, with him. Sammy yeah. Guevara is a talented guy. Sammy Guevara has been given a lot of opportunity. Sammy Guevara is... He's got a lot of weaknesses and uh, they've tried to push him for years and years and years. I think he's a hell of a wrestler, though. I uh-huh. I still think there's a shot with him. I don't know. Yeah. I still... Um... Yeah, I, st- I don't know. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm, I'm at the point of giving up, but I'm, like I said, with the roster being what it is now and being like as top, even we say it's top heavy, even as mid card heavy as it is right now. I mean, there's a lot of guys in that mid card position that are like, we've we've bloody got Adam Copeland in the mid card, and you've got guys like Pack and just. Orange cast, well, Orange cast needs to graduate, but like even just a position for Sabi to be like a premier guy, he can be. It's just very difficult. What Adam I will, Copeland, yeah, Adam Copeland would be slotted back in that main event position whenever it, whenever they need him, though. Like you yeah. think about this year, he's come in for all these months. The only person he's feuded, the only person he's feuded with is um, Christian Cage. Yeah, you yeah, know, he right. hasn't touched MJF and you know Adam Cole and you know, Brian Danielson and all these other programs that he could potentially have. And also, we haven't even got him and Christian as a team again. They'll yeah. they'll be back as a team. So then you've got the Young Bucks feud because the Sting and Derby program, they could run that whole thing back with Edge and Christian because they're trying to rid old guys out of the company, right? So yeah, <laughs> so that is a program ready-made there. Yeah. Really. Let me just read some of these comments. Uh, big up everyone first again. Big up everyone who's in the comment section. Make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Make sure you tune into the various other pieces of content we have on rest of things, whether it's the indie takers, whether it's the E, whether it is the flagship show. Make sure you check it out and make sure you check it out. Break it down. We've got a lot of great content still to come. They broke down Sting's career, they had a yeah. video on Sting. Yep, 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 yep. It's Sting! But, uh, yeah, let's address some of the comments. we got Navy again. Jack Perry going to New Japan is a blessing in disguise for both parties. I think it's the, it's, it's it, it inadvertently gave me something that I wanted to wanted to happen, which is like an extended run um, with an AW guy in Japan. An extended run, not just a pay-per-view, but an extended run in Japan, which is something I did want to see more often. And I'm glad I'm getting it with Jack Perry. I, I'm not a fan of the House of Torture stuff. Oh, that God. that stinks. But that shit makes that, me not want to watch him at all. Fuck yeah, me. but I think I him isolated by himself in Japan is is interesting. And but I do like, I, yeah. No, I'm gonna finish what you're saying. Sorry. I said I do like the like the the look he has with the beard and like I think him as a heel is something that if you told me in 2021 AW that. Jungle Boy would be a pretty good heel, then I, I I wouldn't have believed you. But like seeing him like as a heel, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but there's something there. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So he comes back, yeah, because he's going to come back. Yeah. He comes back to AEW. I'm sure they're going to put him with the Bucks, right? You okay. think about the heat, the, the Bucks and Jack Perry together on television being obnoxious heels. This is fantastic. I think absolutely. But you put him with Anna J, right? As yeah. um. Does that act have legs? Anna Jay and Jack Perry as heels. Conceptually, yes. I, I don't believe it, it, it will actually... Because I... How do I word this nicely? I have not been enthused by the development of Anna Jay, per se. Oh, I haven't either. I, don't. I have not been enthused by... I don't think she's a remarkable promo. Character-wise, okay. she's... Okay. In ring, the less the less said the better. Um, I'm not enthused by her in any so and conceptually, sure, like the look wise, the image presentation, sure, but like when you actually strip down when you actually get down to the nitty-gritty, no, I just I I, I just don't see what Anna J offers long term aside from like aesthetics. So you think he'd be better off without her in this? Yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. At, 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 at most, maybe like, hey, a reference. I have a hot ass girlfriend. I'm better than you people. 
like stuff like vague stuff like that, sure. But like a full time couple act, I have no time for that. I thought that Sammy and Ty together would have been. I, I thought when um, they put those two together, I thought that was going to be a, a. I thought they would be really good. It just, I don't know, just didn't. This didn't work out. <laughs> Did yeah. not work out. I think we are past a slightly couple smooching on screen telling people how good they are and or how sexy they go is is over. Yeah, I think you can, you the only reason why I could work with Jack Perry is because he's doing the Hollywood gimmick and his dad was actually a Hollywood star. But even then, you're veering too much into the, that type of territory where I'm like, it can get old fast. So for me, when it comes to Jack Perry, um I'm not pure enthused. Here is a question though. With the recent acquisitions that AEW have made, I've, there will be a balancing of the books at some point. I, I do expect mm -hmm. talent to go. Mm -hmm. Are there any, like, I think the obvious ones people are speculating about are the Ricky Starks of the world, the Miros, the Malachi Blacks. Do you, are there any other... Um, talent that you expect or you just have an inkling you feel either tony might let go or they might oh, be disgruntled and um when i mean let go see so let their contract expire but um yeah tony might let their contract expire or they'll just take it upon themselves to leave is there anyone you see based on the aqua because i think the landscape of aw right now like has changed like it feels like i won't say a different company but the the landscape can't accommodate all of these guys I just want to say I've got um, Terry Funk um, used to be a, a WCW announcer when he retired in 89. So right now on my screen, I've got Jim Ross, Jim Cornette, and Terry Funk as a commentary team. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> but anyway, um, do I see... Uh, look, guys, uh, I don't think I'm... What's his name? Malachi Black, his deal... Those deals aren't expiring for a long time. Miro... Yeah. But those guys, you know, there's a reason why they, they're not being pushed or he doesn't invest in them really because he knows that they're going to go back whenever yeah. they can. I think he's also learned that when you sign people, you should really be wary of signing people whose wives and significant others work for the other company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is, I mean, I saw Ricochet, Ricochet was floating his info, you know, his, the fact that his deal comes up this year. Like his missus works for WWE. I don't think Tony Khan should even bother. I just think that's a waste of time. If and if you tried to get him, not I, I don't even think he'd leave anyway. But obviously, it's wants more money, and I get that. But I think that you know, getting someone whose partner works there, I just don't think it. I just don't think it works out in the long run, really. But yeah, do I, Starks is a guy. I mean, what it really depends on is you know all these guys that Tony has tried to push or they've been around for a long time and it gets to a point where it's okay what do we do with this guy going forward like i'm not saying this i'm not saying that these guys are going to go anywhere but if you look at a guy like wardlow okay you look at wardlow wardlow has been pushed on and off for years mm. they've you know nothing really ever sticks with wardlow his ceiling i think is a is as a heater <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a heater for a, a top heel that's what i think he's good at and that's not a bad thing you know that's i think that's a good spot for for someone but i mean in a couple of years is tony think oh, what can i do with this guy i don't know maybe he'll let him go David. hobbs is another one as well hobbs has had a lot of stock and start pushes I, I think hobbs has got potential but hobbs might get frustrated and you know he's still young enough to get a, a spot in wwe look at hobbs he's, he's talented as well Hobbs yeah. is, is good. There, yeah. there is an interesting question. Um, and SDK asks, do you think Tony should stop honoring contracts and let people go? No, nah, he won't do that. He won't do that. He's he's already said he won't. I mean, if he if someone if someone's a cunt and they <laughs> and you know they deserve to be fired, well then he'll fire them. But he's not gonna fire people. It's just not how they it's not how he, he does things. And it's good. You know, he's you commit if someone commits to you and your company for three years, well then that's fantastic. You know, he's willing to honor that commitment. Um, which is very honorable honorable in wrestling. You don't really see that. You know, back in the day, WCW, um if you were injured for more than I think it was sixty days, they had the right to cut your contract. Mm. So if you were injured and that's the reason why guys would always just try and get back to work as quickly as possible because they didn't want to get cut.
So that's why, you know, guys were going out there on pain pills and just trying to fucking work, you know, just to try and get out there so they didn't lose their jobs. Lots of guys lost their jobs because they were... David West Smith broke his back uh, on in a WCW ring, broke his back. He was in hospital. Being honourable gets you nowhere. Being honourable gets you nowhere. I mean, but what what is it? Why wouldn't he be honourable? You know, I think Tony Khan, his whole thing was trying to be um, that anti uh, Vince McMahon sort of thing. Vince McMahon was a guy who, you know, would sign people to long term contracts and cut them. You know, he had he had people move across the country and fired them, <laughs> you know, within a week of them moving their whole families. You and know, also, so I don't think there's anything wrong. Sorry. So, and also as well, like I think cutting people, let's say there's somebody who hands in their release right now and cutting mm -hmm. them. Yeah, you might you might think cutting them is okay. They don't want to be a part of my company. Let them go. But then you're giving someone directly to your opposition. Mm -hmm. So that's why you kind of it, it, it's a bad practice. But you kind of okay. Let them finish out their contracts. Kind of it's an old pro wrestling tactic. I'm I'm, I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, you not bury them on the, some companies would flat out bury them on the way out. But like, you kind of decrease the momentum on the way out. That way you, you're not giving your company a the, the opposition a piping hot um wrestler which aw have done on several occasions they gave uh, yeah. this went from wwe to I mean, aw to wwe cody did the same thing punk was a bit different but similar thing so andrade that, was an interesting one andrade was a weird one that was that was booking malpractice in my personal mm. opinion that was weird um but i i don't feel like you should if somebody comes to you and says hey i want to leave I don't think it's an immediate thing. You should be like, "Hey, go," because you're just handing them straight to your opponent, to to your competitors. Um, WWE are the masters are doing this, where they they're like, "Hey, we've released you, thirty day release clause." Now, I don't personally now, for the wrestler's perspective, I think Tony honoring his contracts makes perfect is an incentive for them because they get guaranteed money. If you're unhappy with the unhappy with, okay, at least you're like, okay, I'm gonna buy my time. I get guaranteed money until I leave, and then once I leave, I'm free. I'm free to to actually work. So I think, from a business perspective, like it makes sense for why he why he honors his contract. It keeps people. It keeps things somewhat under control, instead of just like because he's. I think if he slaps a thirty day release clause on people, he's a, he's a, he's a bloody hypocrite, and that's and that's not the type of image you want to send out there. Um, yeah, I think, I think, um, I don't, I think the wrestling business is so, um, <laughs> I think the wrestling business over the years has had so many nasty, dishonorable people in it. I think people look at Tony Khan, what I mean, the fact that he doesn't fire people and he lets their contracts run out, even people in wrestling, they think it's, um, they still talk bad about him. I don't, <laughs> they think it's weird, you know, that he would do such a thing, but there's nothing wrong with being honorable. You get a good reputation amongst wrestlers i mean look look at tony khan and these people that he signed there's obviously a reason why people sign of aw obviously i mean there's a lot of pluses to working for aw over wwe but i mean maybe one of them is that tony khan won't fire me he'll he'll see out he's a man of his word and he'll he'll you know follow uh, my contract he doesn't he's not like vincent man or whatever who um only fo you know follows contracts if they're in his favor Vincent Mann, well, Vincent Mann used to cut contracts all the time. He'd, you, you had to, you had to do what Vince said, though. You always had to, you had to, always had to do what Vince said. But he could just turn around and cut you at any point. But yeah, I think that's another reason why people sign with AEW. Just thinking about it now, it's not only can you, not only do you work less, not only do you get paid more money, you get to keep your image and likeness. You can also take other dates, and you could work TV, two D TV shows and movies and music, whatever you want to do. But also. You know that if you, as long as you don't fuck up and you don't do something stupid or you know get arrested or or, or something like that, you know that this guy he's gonna fulfill it. He's gonna fulfill his commitment to you, which is as someone who, you know, as a family and stuff like that, that is very important. Yeah, um, we'll just a few more comments. Uh, decreasing momentum isn't necessarily a thing, depending on wrestlers. I get going out on your back on your way out. But we see this again, even if a wrestler gets buried on screen, fandom doesn't allow for said momentum to deep for to dip. That's true. These days, I think it's hard to bury someone on the way out. Back in the day, guys would 
I mean, fuck, if a guy was handing his notice, you just have him do jobs all around the loop. You'd do jobs all over the place. Nowadays, I think because um, I think fans are more online than they've ever been before. And also, I think fans, most fans just understand how this is anyway. So even when Moxley left and they had him doing all that stupid shit on the way out, whatever, like, it, you know, when he showed up in AEW or New Japan, it didn't hurt him in any way at all. At all. You know, back in the day, though, when, you know, I'll use, um, Terry Taylor, as an example, Terry Taylor was a red rooster. They had him going around. He was a chicken. That was his gimmick. He was a he was a human chicken, and uh, <laughs> they had him be a human chicken on television. And when they fired him, his career was never the same. How can you take a guy seriously in another company when he was on fucking another TV show, pretend to pretend to be a chicken? He was clucking in the ring like what the fuck, you know? But nowadays, people see for all that stuff. Mustafa Ali was on WWE TV for years doing jobs and look. You know, now, I mean, he's doing pretty well for himself, isn't he? People just, he's talented guys. He's a talented guy. I think fans just, I think if you're good, I think the fans will just accept that you're good and they'll look forward to you either way. You can't really bury guys on the way out. I don't even think WWE bury guys on the way out anymore. I don't think they do. I don't, I don't think so, no. No, especially with Vince gone. I don't think they do that anymore. No. Which is good. Yeah. 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 I think that's all. Okay, let me just address these com um, last few comments. People do take advantage of his kindness sometimes. I'm assuming it's referring to Tony Khan. Um, wrestlers get released and excitement mentally increases because dream matches and potential for their future booking in whatever company. Mm -hmm. FTR, for example, they got released, but the momentum went up due to dream matches. Fans are too well informed for momentum to dip. Even our faves are being buried. We know that's not a reflection of them. Terry Taylor was fantastic. Terry Taylor, I tell you what, Terry Taylor was such a good wrestler. Do you know in the 1980s, <clears throat> three best wrestlers in North America was always debated, but in the in the WWE, um, Bret Hart, Kurt Henning, and Terry Taylor, it was always debate as to who was the best of the wrestlers. Who was the best? Was it Bret Hart? Was it Terry Taylor? Was it Kurt Henning? And some people thought that Terry Taylor was the best of the lot. However, he was Cowboys. Um, he was really aligned with Cowboy Bill Watts. So when he went to work for WWE, uh, you know, he was Cowboys boy. He was one of Bill Watts's Bill Watts's guys. So when he came to WWE, I think they had a target on his back, and that's when they were like, "Yeah, you can be a fucking chicken." Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and they liked Brett and Kurt Henning was they liked Kurt Henning too. But Terry Taylor, he was too associated with um, he was too associated with um, with with Bill Watts. The same with Jim Ross as well. It took Jim Ross years to to shake off that Bill Watts stink, so to speak, to get that reputation of Bill Watts away from him. It took him years before they fired him three times, you know, before he before they trusted him and they <laughs> respected him somewhat anyway. But yeah, sorry, Terry Taylor was a fantastic wrestler. No worries, no worries, man. But yeah, man, I think that wraps it up for today, man. I mean. Who, like I said, I think we always say this. I think the more I watch AW right now, the more I believe Osprey. We, we had a conversation about who can be like a major like draw for AW. And obviously, I don't see Osprey like moving like, as we said, t television ratings don't move like somebody, Osprey's not going to draw, um, you know, a massive spike in the demo or a massive spike in the ratings like week to week. But I think over time, I think Osprey's the guy. Just the reactions he's getting oh, yeah. in these in these towns, and I, I don't want to jump the gun because it might be I don't know because a part of me is being skeptical and saying it is like novelty, recency bias. But the the reactions he's getting, and he's he's one, he's a much better promo than I ever thought he was. Like he's a pretty good promo. Um, it was a good promo anyway. Yeah. Um, I, my my one thing about him was like, okay, the swearing because I knew in New Japan, like he kind of relied on that, but like he's 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 adapting. It's it's still in there a little bit, but he's adapting. But just the reactions he's getting, yeah, like this guy's got top, like this guy's really got like face of the company written all over him. Do you know? Um, I was talking to someone earlier today, and they were talking about Swerve being, oh, you know, Swerve needs to be world champion, and you know. I'm a big fan of Shane Strickland. I always have. I think he's a super talented guy. But I think Osprey coming in, I think he's really just outshone everyone in that company to a point where I'm looking at Swerve and I don't even know if Swerve should be AEW champion at this point. 
And like, and a part of me also thinks that if Swerve wins the title now, he's going to have to drop it to Osprey at Wembley. And that's not that long of a run. And I don't even know if, if that's the case. I don't even think they should bother putting on him because I just don't think that's given the guy a good enough shot. And I also think he, I don't know, man, it's just promos and that laugh and stuff. I just think that I just don't know. I don't know anymore about Swerve. Like, you know. The way you feel about Swerve is the way I feel about Adam Cole. In terms of, I think when Adam, like, I think last year, especially with during the MJF stuff, but even when Adam Cole was like first introduced to AEW, he was like, okay, this is guaranteed like a future um, world champion. Now I'm not so sure. Because I do see, for example, I know you, you're not keen on Swerve, but I do see Swerve winning the championship. No, 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 no. I'm keen on Swerve. Uh, no, no, as, as Osprey. That's what I meant. As keen as Osprey. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, as keen as Osprey. Um, yeah. But I do see Swerve like winning the championship before like Adam Cole. And I think it, it, it's it's a hard. To, and now you've introduced, like, you've, you've given Okada the Continental Classic, which will keep him busy for about like a year, which is fine. But then once you introduce yeah, yeah. something like that into the mix, it's like okay. Then you and then you've got like like other guys like Hangman probably deserves a run, um, another run. Then it's hard for a guy like Cole for me to like really get a hold of that division. Well, there's a lot. Yeah, well, you know, since Adam Cole was injured after he broke his ankle. You know, the measuring stick changed around there, man. It's like they've got Okada, they've got Osprey now. And just those two names in the main event picture, that's uh, that's a big ask, man, to even compete with those guys. And I'm not saying he can't, because I think Adam Cole's really talented. I saw people, um, was was were people saying he was washed? Was he one of the guys that um, I saw people talking about being washed? Yeah, I think, I think yeah he's not. The yeah, that's right. I remember he was on, he was. I don't think he's washed. We can't say that because he we don't know what he looks like when he comes, you know, he's been injured for ages. And before then, he, he was fine. He Adam Cole had good matches. You know, I saw the one on the MJF match on Dynamite and they had that tag team match with FTR on Collision. That was a fantastic match. I think Adam Cole, as a heel, with a strong heel unit around him, I think could still be a world champion. But I think it's going to be hard at this stage for him because the amount of competition is on that roster. And he also needs to come back and see where he's at physically as well. Yeah. You no, know, is he going to be able to work to the level he was before? That was a bad break. That was a really bad break. Um, his ankle. I mean, I hope the guy comes back, and I think I think Adam Cole is a really talented guy. I just hope he comes back oh, and can still cool. work. Yeah, I, I just you know, and he seems to be a nice guy as well. You know. I think AW needs to exercise short reigns. I wouldn't mind him losing at all in, but I have faith in Swerve's momentum after losing. I don't have faith in anyone's momentum after losing. I don't know. I just think AEW, I don't know, once a guy loses, they kind of lose track of that person. And yeah. they kind of just let that person go by the wayside. Yeah. Um, but another thing as well, I just want to mention this. You know, MJF oh. is another guy. We've got MJF and Adam Cole, right? Those two guys are going to come back. They've both got something to prove. And I really hope when they come back that they can work something out and they can have a really good program because I think Cole was probably got a lot to prove to himself in terms of where he's at physically and also shutting down people that think he's their body shame and think he's not as good as he used to be. And also Max has got something to prove because he wants people to know that, you know, he's still I'm sure Max thinks that he's the best guy in the company and he wants to prove it again. So I hope that when they come back and everyone's fit and they get that program going. I hope that they can do something good because I think potentially it could be good, but obviously those two might get a bit self-indulgent. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm worried about. But, I mean, you think about it. And, of course, just did WWE personally. He, he, uh, came because of, he came because of Vince. Like, let, a hindsight is 20, 20. He, yeah, like, he, he, he shouldn't have stayed in WWE. It was you know, Vince, who, who knew that Vince was going to be accused of being a... Uh, yeah, see you on <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't know. And at the time, it was the best move for him. At the at the time, mindset. Yeah, obviously, in this current Triple H regime, yeah, I think yeah, he, he'd, be, he'd, he'd be great. But at the WWE at that time with Vince, hell no, three, hell three no. Ago, yeah, three years ago they wanted him to be a manager. So hell, you know, no. he didn't want to be a manager. 
You know, and he's had a bad, he's had a bad string of luck, Adam Cole. He's had two really bad injuries, like really bad injuries, and every single time, it's really hurt his momentum. Like, but if you look at the way um, he's been booked and stuff, you know, I mean, he's always in the mix. He's always, you know, in the main event program with someone. You know, whether it be, you know, before he got injured, he was working with um, Hangman the first time before he had the the concussion, the two concussions, I, sh I should say. Then he was in a main event program with MGF the second time round. Then he'll come back and he'll be in another main event program now. So it's not as if, you know, they don't respect him and they don't he's he's in a really good position on the card. I'm sure he's um I'm sure he's happy as well in terms of the people that he gets to work with as well. Because at the end of the day, you know, he's working with his mates and his missus at the end of the day, and I'm sure that's I'm sure that's good to some degree. But you know, we don't know where he's gonna be. We don't, you know what the funny thing is with wrestling. His deal runs out in three years, probably. We don't know. He could go back in three years. Never. He could, could go back. You know, um, any of these guys could go back in a few years. We just don't. There's a lot of guys in AEW, man. Like a lot of guys. And there's a lot of guys to compete with. And some of these guys whose deals come up, they might not want to compete against Okada and Osprey and, and NJF and the rest of them. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, man, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. But can you guys can, can you hear me? I yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Um, but we're yeah, gonna do a WrestleMania preview next week. I want to talk about WrestleMania. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Definitely, definitely, definitely. We will talk about mania. You know, it's, it's gearing up to be one of the biggest manias, like just from a financial perspective. But no, this is the biggest one of all time. Yeah, yeah. This is the biggest um, one of all time. For sure, for sure. Anything um, on the card you're looking forward to, or I'll be very honest, I I couldn't give a <laughs> um probably I don't even know what's on the card. All I or probably I, I want to see how that main event unfolds with like Rock and Cody and Roman, just see how that unfolds. Um, but like I want to see what Rock looks like. Uh, and I want to see yeah, how much I want to see how much he's in the ring. I'm curious about that match. Um, they'll win. Uh, Rock and, and Reigns will win that match. I was actually looking at the odds earlier on today. Actually, they're yeah, yeah, the massive favourites to win that match. Massive favourites to win that match. Like, so yeah. But I mean, the following day, Cody's a favourite to win the um the world title. But in saying that, he was a favourite to win last year until the day of, and then the odds the odds <laughs> had a massive swing in the other direction towards Roman Reigns. So um, but yeah, th I mean, I. I don't ever look forward to these shows anyway, like WrestleMania. I, I went through about the last WrestleMania I watched until last year was the one with Sting and Triple H, and that really turned me off the whole thing. So I didn't watch them anymore. And then my son wanted to watch last year's one. So I watched the whole two days of him last year. And um he wants to watch this year as well. So we're gonna watch it. But I mean, as far as the card goes, um I I don't I'm sure there'll be some good stuff on the card. I'm sure there'll be. So um and also i'm sure visually i'm sure it'll look fantastic as well um, yeah, look, but yeah look, i mean look i look great. forward to talking about it. anyway i like talking about wrestlemania wrestlemania the history of wrestlemania is awesome it's right yeah yeah stay tuned for that like i said before like share comment and subscribe algorithm 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 you know what i'm saying um we'll be tuned in say we'll be tuned in next week monday it's been commissioners corner it's been your boy nk so knowledge Thank you for watching. We will catch you guys later. Peace out.